Uh, true or false, the doctrine of election does not mean that God predestines some to heaven and others to hell. Uh, it might shock you, but this one is mine. So, okay, uh, okay. Uh, all right. Well, I don't want to go first every time. So, uh, Renee, why don't you go first this time? Uh, certainly true. It does not say any, many, many, mo. Uh, I'll pick Joe and not John. It, it's not that he. The doctrine of election. There's a couple of there's a couple of issues here. One of the things is they re, they they clump together election, which just means to be chosen, or in some instances it can mean a set apart group. It just depends. Um, like Esau, Esau, I uh, I hated Jacob. I loved. Well, that yeah, because Jacob was preferred and chosen to be the line that Jesus would be born through. So they would be blessed because the Savior would be born through that line. Uh, and Jacob is the nation of Israel and Esau is the nation of Edom. So the, the, the Esau, I love Jacob, I hate it, is actually talking about the nations, not the individuals. And so it's not like God said, you know, I'm going to deny Esau salvation uh, and and only save Jacob. It was the two nations were chosen. Uh, Esau was not chosen. Israel was or Jacob was same thing. And then you'll see like the elect has obtained it. And here here's why. The reason in the Old Testament, I think it's in the book of uh, uh, I can't remember where, but it's Elijah. Right where <clears throat> Elijah's with God and God says, there are still 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. That is an election. That's the election. The election hath obtained it. See, but, but why did they obtain it? Because they didn't bow their knee to Baal. They were faithful and believed in the living God and not a false God. Not because God said, I'm going to choose these 7,000 people to remain, uh, believing in me they were elect because they believed and uh we're predestined to be conformed in the image of his son uh those that are in christ are predestined to be conformed and it says that we're elect according to the foreknowledge of god so god knows the end from the beginning who will believe who won't believe and he knows us before the foundation of the world he knows who's his so since he sees the whole picture it's his foreknowledge he can say so and so and so and so is elect because he has foreknowledge of it but to say that christ only died for his own he died for the elect it's just a, to me i know they say it's unconditional election but I still see spiritual pride in that they still think there's something good in them that God chose them to be one of the elect. I, you know, because if you listen to people like John Piper, he's like, sometimes I argue with my wife and I'm thinking, am I really one of the elect? See what I'm saying? Because he really thinks he's saved or God chose him to be saved because he's such a good guy. So, and if he was chosen because he's such a good guy, then he'll continue to be such a good guy. And maybe he's not one of the elect after all. So I think this is very dangerous. I think anything God says about the end from the beginning and election is because of his foreknowledge. And as the scriptures say, the seed of Abraham is Christ. It's Jesus. And so all those promises are in him, not in a certain group of people that are chosen. The promises are in him. So the election, the, Jesus is called elect. Israel's called elect. Any Anytime somebody's chosen for something or set aside or set apart, uh, can be it can be used in that word. So I think it's very dangerous to say, oh, you're just, you know, you're not one of the elect. How is that good news? Look, God only died for a certain uh elect group of people not sure you're one of them 
uh, but here's the gospel in case maybe he lets you believe it. And also, how bad would that be if somebody uh, hates God and you and and thinks that he only chose a certain people and therefore they're just going to stay in their unbelief because God probably didn't choose them to believe anyway. I think this is just wrong, completely wrong. Uh, and uh, John Calvin wrote that in his 20s, straight out of the Catholic Church. I don't know why anybody would listen to that tyrant on anything of theological value. I have no idea why people are Calvinists. Mm-hmm. Hey, thank you. Uh, well, it goes back further. Um, um, even before Augustine to uh, what's called Manichaean Gnosticism and uh, Cal um, Cal uh, Augustine was a, a, a Gnostic uh, for, I think, 10 or 12 years. Um, and then he uh, became a Christian of some sort. And uh, but a lot of the baggage from Gnosticism he brought along with him and, and introduced it into the church. Uh, and then Calvin basically is just repeating the teachings of uh, Augustine. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is this, uh, uh, nobody ever has been elected for salvation. Exclamation point, okay? Not one person in history has been elected for salvation. Uh, Rene explained it exactly right. Election is God choosing to use a person for a purpose, for God's purpose. And uh, if you go to uh, our playlist on Ro uh, Romans, the book of Romans, and go to chapter 9, this is the foundational chapter of, for Calvinists, and you'll see how uh, we refuted their interpretation of chapter nine, and now you, you can understand it correctly if you watch that. But the the idea is uh, that um, God is sovereign, and He can choose to use anybody for whatever purpose it, He He wants, and and that's that's what He's done. Uh, but when it comes to salvation, Jesus is like this: He's offering eternal life as a gift to every person in the world. He's not selecting some and not, and not allowing others to have this gift. He's offering this gift to every single person. It's up to each individual to either receive it or not. So, uh, but with Calvinist e election is that, that uh, God gives you the gift. You don't even know you got it, but you got it. And, and, they, uh, and God did it well, imposed it on you. And others, he'll never let them have it. So it's evil. It's one of the most evil philosophies in history. Uh, okay, Sister Heather. Yes, it took me a minute to get back to my unmute button. Um, I actually have some, some verses. Well, actually, um, let me just recommend, because it would take too long for me to read this, but after the program, go read Matthew 13. But I'm going to give you some highlights from it real quick. Um, but my question is, who did Jesus hang out with? Did he hang out with the religious leaders? Did he hang out with the sinners? Why? Because the religious leaders thought they were righteous already. They didn't realize that they needed to be saved. But the sinners knew that they were messed up and broken. So those are the people that Jesus hung out with. So then we've got these parables that Jesus gave us. Um, the parable of the farmer who scattered, um, scattering seed. So he scatters the seed and some falls along the road, some falls um, uh, among the thorns and some falls on fertile soil. The difference between those were they receptive? That's the point for that, that I see. And then you've got the parable of the wheat and the tares. And I'm going to get back to that one because that's one of my favorites. The parable of the mustard seed. It's, it's still, it's, it's where's your heart when you hear, when you hear the truth. The parable of the yeast. There's truth in there. You just got to, and, and if you, if the truth is there, it's going to grow. But if it's not there, it won't grow. But the parable of the wheat and the tares, like I said, that's one of my favorites. Here's the thing. In, in nature, with, with plants, because I know a little bit about plants, when wheat grows, um, 
it grows a grain inside of its head. And when it's mature, the head bows. The head bows. It literally bows over. Tears have nothing in the head. So when, the, when it's fully mature, it stands up straight. All right. So here's my point on this. If you are bowing to the grace of God and you are bowing to Christ and you are bowing to what he did on the cross, you are a wheat. If you are not bowing, standing in pride on everything that you have done, you are a tear. That is the difference. Did you hear the same gospel message? Yes, you did. Does that mean that you're maybe saved? Maybe. But if you're standing on your own works, regardless of what you believed whether for salvation or not if you're standing on your own works you're not standing on the grace of god and that is the point of that Woo! that's beautiful amen uh now the the wheat and the tares you made me feel a little bit self-conscious i did i didn't want to have my head too upright or people might <laughs> apply, apply that to me. So I'm, I'm I actually be like, had my big sister in Christ. Um, I was telling her about what I had discovered about um, that parable. And it's so funny. She said, I, I'm just, she, she said, I've got chills. I'm just imagining a sickle coming through and cutting off the tears. And I was like, yeah. And the weed is bowed down. So it's not getting cut off. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not, that's the, that, let me say this before we move on to the next person. That is not to say someone can lose their salvation. That is to say your pride will knock you to your knees. That's what I'm saying with that. Yeah. Oh, illustration. Uh, okay. Um, um, Jordan, that was your question. So what's the answer? Yeah. So it's funny that that parable got brought up because brother Ben and I, I don't know, I feel like we spent like an hour just talking about that parable and a couple of other verses um, right before we came on. So that one's fresh on my mind because I think a lot of people will misuse that parable and just say that the very last seeds were the ones that were saved. And that's not what it's saying at all. So, and not a lot of people understand that for some reason, but what I would say um, to Mr. Calvin is who are the elect? The Bible is very clear. The elect are those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood atonement in Jesus Christ alone, nothing else, not your water baptism, not your transubstantiation communion, only Jesus Christ can save you. And when you are saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of deliverance. You are baptized into the body of Christ, making you part of the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church, and you are circumcised from your heart, make, or your heart is circumcised from your flesh, separating you, sanctifying you. So those are the elect. The elect are predestined unto good works. Those good works are what we are judged by. How much were we in correlation with the good works we were predestined to do? Did we walk by that man who was sitting on the street begging for money because we were just a little too busy today? Or did we stop and give a moment to share God's love and possibly share the gospel? That is the work we are predestined to do. And for me, it's insulting that so many people, Calvinists especially, will limit the sovereignty of God by saying that, well, if God is sovereign, we can't have free will. You, We cannot even understand eternity. We can't even understand the Trinity. So what makes you think we can fully understand this doctrine of election versus free will? God's ways are higher than our ways. And anytime we try to attach a tulip formula or any kind of basic understanding to an infinite God, we are limiting God. We just need to let God be and rest in his grace and mercy. Uh, amen to that one. Uh, Brother Luke, I, I wanted to read the section that the Calvinists often use here. and I, But everybody on the panel uh, made this point. And so I'm just going to confirm it here. Now, what they usually use is Romans chapter 9, where it says, It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Right? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for, do you think God didn't know Pharaoh would never come to him as God? Of course he knew that. Therefore he will have mercy 
on who he will have mercy. Why does he, then what will thou say to me? Why does he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? Well, the Bible doesn't say God makes men not believe in him. It doesn't say that. And it doesn't say that uh, God, everything we do in this life is God's will. Everything we do, every his sovereignty is so sovereign that he doesn't give us choices. I, I don't believe that at all. We could really take that far and that could get very dangerous, right? Why does he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? Oh, nay, but, and this is what Tyler was saying. Oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Has not the potter over power over the clay or the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, much patience, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? So there's a hypothetical, Paul. Hey, we can't judge God. We don't know. How do we know? He didn't give them chance after chance after chance after chance to repent. We don't know that. It says God has foreknowledge. He knows the end from the beginning. So why would we reply against God? He uses people and sets them up to do his will. And it's not where everything we do is his will, but he will choose people to serve him in certain ways, right? And that's his choice. We have we can't say uh, to God, you know, why are you doing this? Why are why have you made me this way or whatever? But Paul is saying clearly, how do we know that what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long sufferings the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. And then he goes into not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles uh, and that they, the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained righteousness, even the righteousness, which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith. But as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. It is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So it all comes down to believing. Does God prevent people from believing? Jesus said he, he will draw all men unto him. And how do we know that God in his long suffering hasn't waited and showed patience with these people and since he has the foreknowledge knows they're never going to repent and so he goes ahead and uses them uh and lets them build it up so that his wrath and power on them can be known he knows they're a vessel of dishonor so he lets them build up the judgment so that they can be an example of his power and glory and then those of us that do believe so that we can be an example of his mercy and his grace. But it all hinges on believing. And there's nowhere in scripture where God says, I will not allow that person to repent. I will not allow that person to believe on me or change his mind and come to me. Nowhere in scripture. And so when they take these sections out like this, it's even Paul gives the hypothetical here. You know, of course, we don't understand the workings of God, exactly how he works and in, in all his glory. But based on his character and who he is as revealed through scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ. It's just repellent. We can make this assumption, like Paul said, how do we know that he didn't show them a patience and time and and grace? And they, he knew that. So. um yeah, I think when they take these sections out of there uh, and turn it into a man-made, like you said, the, the tulip, a little systematic thing where we put God in a box, it's just wrong. How can that be right? It just it, It's just not right. Mm -hmm. I actually have verses to back that up, Renee. Um, 
And uh, the one that I'm looking at first is Second Peter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. I'm sorry, concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. And here's the kicker. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And this one is probably going to make my brother Kev cry because I know he cries with this one. Sorry, didn't mean to call you out, Kev. Anyway, Luke chapter 13, verse 34. One of my very favorite verses. Let me find it. Okay. This is Jesus' own words. If Paul's words weren't enough and Peter's weren't enough, then we've got Jesus. And this is the heart of God right here. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the, kill, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing Here's the point. You have to be willing. If you're not willing, then you can't be saved. Not because you are not capable of being saved, but because your heart is not open to it. Yeah. Amen. I have uh, a, a verse on predestination. Can I can I give that? Yeah. All right. So there's a lot of confusion about predestination. And it's not that he predestined certain people to be saved. He predestined those that are in Christ to be conformed in the image of Jesus. So everybody that is in Christ, he predestined to be risen bodily and have a glorified body uh, and uh, have the Holy Spirit like Jesus. So everybody in Christ is predestined. So uh, it's not, you're not predestined to be in Christ. Uh, like Heather was saying, that it's not his will that any should perish, but all come to repentance. So uh, if God's will is always done, then it wouldn't make sense. The verses I, I showed you about why does the potter, why does the clay uh, say to the potter, why have you made me this way and that kind of thing. Because that's about God choosing what to do with those people as a vessel of honor or dishonor. It's it's not that he chose them not to believe so that he could use them as a vessel of dishonor. It's They're a vessel of dishonor because they won't believe. And he predestines them to a judgment so that his uh, glory and power and wrath can be manifest for the rest of us to see it. Um, and so... Right here, it says in Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow. Here it is. We know that all things work together for good, then that love God to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, foreknow that foreknowledge of God, he knows. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called he also justified and who he justified he also glorified so it it's it's a twisted doctrine of predestination it doesn't say we're predestined to believe or not believe but those that do believe are predestined to other things by god mm -hmm. And the one thing I would say about that as well, and it, I think this is a huge reason why so many Calvinists also have to believe in replacement theology, but we all can agree that the same God in the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament. God did not just come for his chosen people, the Israels. He expanded his grace to the entire world. So how can we take back that expansion and use replacement theology and make the elect now the church. It's just ridiculous to me. Mm -hmm. The uh, verse that you cited, uh, Heather, uh, in Second Peter, that one verse refutes two of the five points of TULIP. Uh, 
unconditional election and irresistible grace. Uh, it's, well, I, I have a playlist on my brother Luke channel, uh, Calvinism Debunked, uh, but really uh, I think it's well done, but I really recommend everybody go to these two channels that are recommended on the CES uh, list of recommended channels, um, Beyond the Fundamentals and Soteriology 101, Leighton Flowers. Uh, these two individuals are the best. I don't think anybody's better than them at, at uh, showing the problems of Calvinism. So please uh, subscribe to those channels. If, if, if Calvinism is something you, you want to learn more about and understand why uh, we hate it so much, uh, it is, it is it really evil.